Welcome everyone to another video from the Garish Crackle. This video essay upload on international relations is a break from the cultural versus uni cultural relativism versus universalism debate as it gets pretty intense. So I thought it was necessary to take a break and explore a different feature in international relations, which is the morality of humanitarian intervention. It's also a topic in philosophy and as citizens of the world, I think it's important that everybody's well versed in this, this matter. So stick around and have some fun. Thanks, everyone. Turning, turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. These first few words of William Butler Yeats' poem, The Second Coming, highlights the spread of darkness within the structure of our international world order of nation states. As sovereignty is challenged and sovereignty is not challenged enough. As far as international law supporting the world order goes, the United Nations Security Council is the head of power in international affairs. The United Na Nations Charter, which is not to be confused with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, respects the boundaries of nation states over and above that of human rights. So then, whenever a state intervenes with military in other states' affairs in order to protect victims of tyranny, the fundamental question asked is, does morality trump legality? The answer is yes. What then are the implications for a future world order? This video essay deals with humanitarian intervention and questions the rights of nation states in going to war to protect civilians, civilians whose own governments are violating and abusing their rights. The issue of intervention is a contentious one. Many scholars concede that self-interests of the intervening states are the main priority and that they invade under the guise of defending the rights of civilians. However, citizens of the international community like you and I express shock and horror as people fall victim to genocide and the ills of atrocities, whilst governments stand by and watch, as with Rwanda, Darfur and Afghanistan. This video essay explores the contested topic of intervention with regard to ethical principles of utilitarianism, consequentialism, just ad bellum, just in bello, proportionality, discrimination, and collective responsibility. Within an international community, individuals are increasingly being recognized for their rights. The global cosmopolitan culture is eroding traditional concepts of nation states and their right to sovereignty. This is a good thing. For far too long have we seen the rights of minorities abused within states. I agree that humanitarian intervention is vital for the upkeep of humanity and I hope to prove this in this upload. The Murky Waters of Humanitarian Intervention Thomas Frank and Nigel Rodley have a hard time defining humanitarian intervention. They question what sorts of atrocities, against which type of people, under whose leadership, against which type of rule. Adam Roberts defines humanitarian war as an oxymoron. 
This coincides with what Cody calls an air of paradox, explaining that resorting to armed intervention above economic sanctions and foreign aids demonstrate that there is a solid bias within nation states who seek to harm others to pursue their own ends. The complications of summing up and defining humanitarian intervention are problematic as nation interests come into conflict with humanitarian interests. And, as Cody asserts, self-interests are never absent from international affairs. Policies of impartiality and discrimination also add to the murkiness of finding a definition. To which degree are human rights protected? All or some? Rosalind Higgins elaborates on the problematic nature of defining humanitarian intervention by expressing that efforts to try and stabilize hostile regions with the use of force has a long history and falls into two wide-ranging categories. Just ad bellum, the conditions which properly justify force, and just in bello, principles which dictate how to behave when during times of hostilities. Michael Schmidt states that these policies humanize hostilities, especially just in Bello, which focuses on the protection and support of civilians. He provides a more thorough definition and states that international law relies on the consent of nation states. Accordingly, there are two types of humanitarian intervention, one which states give their assent and the others which don't. When trying to find a definition, one needs to ask, is it morally permissible to kill within foreign borders in order to defend victims of atrocities? I feel for the most part that yes, for the common good of humanity, the benefits of preserving dignity and rights of individuals outweigh the cost of going to war. Sovereignty must and can only survive by the will of the people supporting it, and the common good of humankind. Tyrannical regimes need to know that they can no longer be protected by the concept of state borders in the ever-increasing state of globalization. Justifying intervention is becoming more and more widely accepted within the international community. Cody asserts that before going to war, nations must have insights into the effects of our hostile actions in proportion to the atrocities caused by the government being attacked. This concept of proportionality is echoed by Frank, who analyzes the long-running discourse of means and ends. According to him, when a country intervenes across borders, without consent, to serve and protect human rights, the means may technically be illegal. As going against international law, the UN Security Council, but the ends could create a greater outcome for the common good of humanity. Utilitarianism is defined as the moral worth of an action which is determined by its contribution to its overall utility. Have past interventions provided good outcomes and at what cost? Frank and Rodley, along with other scholars, have provided a systematic analysis of past humanitarian interventions dating back to the 1800s. Their work is specifically aimed at providing evidence that unilateral force remains and should remain illegal except in instances of self-defense, and that past examples does not constitute the basis for a definable, workable, or desirable new rule of law which in the future would make unilateral interventions permissible. Unilateral can be defined as the course of one state to act according to its own decision. This is different from the more democratic multilateralism, which includes the consensus of many states. They assert that theorists who advocate humanitarian intervention have failed to sufficiently provide a means which is practical and critical, credible to discriminate between the few examples of legitimate humanitarianism among the mass of illegality. They reach this conclusion 
by looking at where there was a desperate need for assistance and yet nothing was done. They cite examples of the Jews in Nazi Germany, the Armenians, the Hutus of Burundi and the Sudan. Yet, Walter Clark and Jeffrey Hertz um, agree that the US-led forces in Operation Restore Hope within Somalia were entirely free of selfish needs, even if the price of intervening came high. Accordingly, 100,000 Somalia lives were saved by the good intentions of the American soldiers, many who in turn lost their own lives. Although Luke Ganville describes President Bush Sr.'s decision to intervene into the Mogadishu crisis in 1992 as an ideational false start, all scholars concede that the interests were purely humanitarian. His work coincides with that of Clark and asserts initially that the Bush administration did not contain material or national interests. It was genuine concern, especially for the starving children. Yet the life of the operation could not be sustained in the ever mounting casualties of the US troops and the ever increasing costs of war. Clark continues that the tragedy escalated as the Clinton administration withdrew troops, revealing the inadequacy of the UN in carrying out its tasks in peacekeeping. This was due to a lack of resources and capability. Accordingly, there was a great amount of hope that the dismantling of the Cold War would finally enable the UN to end conflicts in disaster zones. However, Unreformed bureaucracy made the decision-making process cumbersome, resulting in appointment-making to unqualified people. Ultimately, the cost of Somalia was tragic, as Clark asserts that the reluctance to save the people of Rwanda lies in the mass of American troops slain in Somalia. Thank you very much for listening. That's it for today. Um, I will be continuing with um, both my international relations subjects. With the morality of humanitarian intervention, I'm going to be further delving into the evolution of the United Nations towards humanitarianism with my next video. Until then, though, many, many blessings. Enjoy your week. Goodbye, everyone.